Are you wondering how you can learn more about food? Well, you're in the right place. This is the Chakula Podcast, brought to you by the Root to Food Initiative, a show that celebrates authentic Kenyan dishes and serves you hot conversations about food in Kenya from an economic, social, and political lens. Semanasi kwenye social media at Root to Food on Instagram, at Root to Food on Twitter, and Root to Food on Facebook. And now, here's your host, Felistas Mwalia. Hello and welcome to the Chakula podcast. In this episode, we will be speaking to one person who has taken the conversation around food, food rights, and identity way beyond the borders. Chef Kabui, we are really honored to speak to you today. Asante and karibu sana to the Chakula podcast. Thank you so very much. How are you? I'm very well. Asante sana for all uh, the good work you're doing mm-hmm. uh, and uh, for reaching out. Uh, I'm very excited to be sharing a few ideas uh, uh, to Kenya from uh, the U.S. You have such a rich portfolio and I really admire your work around food justice and identity. But before we get there, could you kindly tell us who you are and how you started all this? Yes, uh, I started my journey in the central part of Kenya in a place called Kangema back then, but uh, it has since been divided to to, uh, two constituencies. So the place now I hail from now is Madioya. Uh, I was born to a coffee farmer. Uh, My mother grew coffee and other subsistence uh, crops. And then uh, my dad worked in the city. He had a a restaurant and a bar uh, in the downtown part of uh, Nairobi. And I spent 10 years with my mother in the village. Uh, So I learned quite a bit about food, which is the basis of uh, the work that I do today. But after 10 years, I moved with my father to go to school in the city in Nairobi. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's where that where I living with my father when I learned about activism because my parents had been deeply involved in the struggle for liberation in Kenya. My dad had a restaurant uh, during the colonial era, and he left. He lost the restaurant because of his activities uh, with the freedom struggle. So those are the kind of foundations uh, uh, of my work in Kenya. And then I moved to the U.S. when I was 20 years old to go to, to school, and I've been here since. Uh, And uh, I came here, I studied political science, yes. Mm -hmm. I studied political science and philosophy for my undergraduate. And I attended a a historically black college, which is what is referred to the U.S. HBCU. And uh, from there, I went to graduate school where I did two masters, one in urban anthropology and the second one is medical anthropology. Uh, After working for a a while and uh, studying, uh, doing my own independent PhD for four years, I went back to culinary school and I studied uh, culinary arts. And uh, then that's when I started working around the uh, issues of food in summer. You're not just an ordinary chef, but specifically a food activist and food strategist and an organic chef. How did you become a chef in the first place? I mean, is this something you've always wanted to do? Yes, uh, so uh, becoming a chef to me was, uh, I became a chef in a roundabout way, if I can say so. Mm -hmm. Number one, uh, when I was living with my uh, mother, I ate food that we basically grew. We bought very little food. We had animals, uh, so we we were able to get our own meat. We had chickens, we had uh, grains, we grew our own corn, potatoes. Then we grew our fruits. Uh, we had sugarcane, uh, guavas, oranges, avocados, all, all kinds of fruits. Then we also had uh, our own herbs. My mother had a small herb garden. So I was used to eating really good food uh, when I was living with my mother. Then when I moved to the city with my father, my father, they owned a business and they had uh, employees there. So one of the employees was tasked with going to the market most times to buy fresh food to come and prepare food for us. In fact, when I was in high school, I would leave Isili High School, which is where I went to high school, mm-hmm. and I would come to town for lunch. So it was a very rushed thing. So anyway, so I grew up eating very good food. When I came to the U.S., it was the very first time I had been to a boarding school. I never went to boarding school. So it was actually the first time I was eating food away from home and the food was horrible the food made me sick <laughs> you know so when you uh, mix that with a culture shock yeah you know i'm young being away from home couldn't take food so anyway so that's when i realized the food was important you know i had been really eating good food so i started reading more about food why is the food in the u.s so different from the food where how i grew up you know how come i was feeling so bad i went on a quest to understand why the food didn't taste good 
Secondly, I found that people are quite obese in the US. So I was like, okay, why are all these people living so an advanced country and still having health issues? Because yeah. some health issues are tied to our weight. So that's when I learned that uh, their, uh, the diet was very uh, closely tied to politics. You know, food is the most political thing you ever touch in your life. That's that's what I found out. That when I found that food was political, then I, I decided to do something about it. Because obviously, food is one basic thing that we need. We can't live without yeah. food. So if somebody is controlling your food, then obviously it can be can be helped. Your love for indigenous food culture, seeds and land is so deep. Why do you think that this aspect of food is important? Well, number one, uh, there, there's... a uh, I'm very impressed the last time I visited Kenya, and I visit Kenya quite often. So mm-hmm. I was there in January of uh, this year. And, uh, you know, so there's a, a, a movement towards eating healthy, you know, indigenous food, let me put that way. But there's a reason why we, we were strayed away from indigenous food, because uh, you eat the way you think. You eat the way you think. So if you've been socialized to eat your own food and to be literate about food, then you eat food that's more appropriate for you. So for me, it's not a lot about indigenous food, but indigenous way of thinking. If you're thinking in an indigenous way, then you eat indigenous food. If you're thinking in a healthy way, then you eat healthy food. So it's not so much about this food or that food, but what one, why we consume the food how we consume the food, and who controls that food that we eat. I always say my grandmother would have been eating shiitake mushroom, chanterelles, if that food was available at that time. So it's not that, okay, we don't, because I think actually, if you think about it, to say that this is the only food that we eat is to colonize African food still. Because no food, if you, okay, if we say, okay, which is indigenous food? Okay, we say, okay, it's modokoi, or gideri. Okay, we're only going to a certain stage. If we go back to our foods, Mm-hmm. We, now it becomes a philosophical problem. Because if we go so far, you know, it's okay. There was, there's a time that people eat, started eating modokoi, for example. There is a time that Africans started eating gideri. They were eating something else before that. So if you keep going farther back, further back, you find that people are eating uh, different foods farther back in history. So what I'm saying is that I don't agree with the fact that, oh, this is kikuyu food or this is our food. Yeah. Our food is the best food we can get at any given time. When you politicize the food, other people come and dictate what kind of food you need to eat so that they can create a market for their own food. Mm. Make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. So there's a reason why we eat bread. We started eating bread in Kenya because we were politically dominated by people who are eating bread. And it was in the interest of those people who dominated us to sell us wheat because we were controlling the wheat. So they were finally trying to find a market for their food. And that's still going on to, the, to this day. If KFC brings chicken to Kenya, that means it's creating employment for people in the U.S. Somebody had to grow the feed for that chicken. Somebody had to sell those chicks. Somebody had to transport those chicks. Somebody had to process those chickens. Somebody had to package those chickens. Then somebody had to preserve those chickens. And then somebody has to be paid to, to export those chickens from here to Kenya. All those are jobs that are being created at every step of the way. Now, how does it damage the Kenyan farmer? If you're a Kenyan farmer who was selling chickens to the Kenyan market, mm-hmm and a million pounds of chickens are coming, it's the reverse now. That's somebody who was growing feed for the chicken that will no longer be able to grow feed because they don't have anywhere to sell it. Because again, we remember, our market is constant. Our market doesn't expand because other people brought the chicken in. So what that means is that you don't have somebody growing uh, the feed for the chicken for that number of people. You don't have people who are processing those chickens. You don't have people who are transporting those chickens, who are storing that chicken. Somebody, uh, the market for the energy that's being used, somebody using electricity, for example, to mm-hmm. store the chicken. Somebody using electricity to, to, to run the machines to process all those chickens. All that people who are being fired by simply you walking into a KFC and eating KFC. Now, that's a new form of slavery. So you fire people and you damage your economy just by what choice of food you make to eat. And that's why I use the term food literacy. We are Mm -hmm. illiterate about how this system works. One thing my father told me is that, Kabui, never play any game. I don't care what the the stakes are for the Mm -hmm. game. If you don't know the game, because you'll be made a fool and you'll be taken advantage of at every time. That's one sure way to, to lose, to play a game you don't know. We are playing a game we don't know. So people are just, we are thinking, oh, we are going to eat just because of taste. 
The system is so, has become so sophisticated that people, the one, they know, they really understand the market. It's easy to know people's uh, preferences yeah. uh, based on age, based on income level and all that kind of stuff. And people use that information to dominate other people in the world. And at the end of the day, I think that the, what they're trying to bring here is not even sustainable. So uh, you're talking about health and sustainability, right? Yeah. And I say that to start with, the whole chain is not sustainable in all ways, environmentally, economically, and uh, socially, culturally, and uh, politically, and uh, so forth. I mainly talked about the economic and sustainability of eating foreign food. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the environment, the sustainability from an environmental yeah. uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. So in the US, I can tell you, there is a big bias to subsidize large corporations because large corporations have political, more political power. So they can influence the policy of the government because they have more money. So what these companies do is they hire uh, people who are called lobbyists, which are really basically people who go and influence policy to their advantage. So when these companies influence policy, the policy funds or directs more government resources towards chemical uh, dependent agriculture. These corporations who are selling chemicals want those seeds that use chemicals to be more, uh, to be more to be funded more by the government. So you find that three quarters of uh, the subsidies that are given to the farmers in the U.S. Mm -hmm. goes towards a uh, produce like corn, wheat, and uh, cotton. Those are the most genetically modified plants that you have in the U.S. So those uh, genetically modified plants do use chemicals such as Roundup. The way that Roundup came into being as a weed killer is that during the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. the corporation that had been given the contract by the government mm -hmm. to, to create a defoliator so that they can use that chemical to, to spray in the forest where the indigenous people in Vietnam were conducting an, a, a guerrilla warfare, an armed struggle against the, the, uh, the, uh, the occupation of their country. That, default, that company had a projection that the war in Vietnam would take much longer than it actually did. Wow. So that means that by the, war, by the time the war abruptly ended, mm -hmm. that corporation had a lot of uh, chemicals that they, had, they were planning to sell the government that they didn't know what to do with. So what they decided to do is to make something that the farmers can use. And that's how wow. they made Roundup. So round, oh. Roundup, actually, the farmers are being fed the remains of war. So the war, the guns were now turned towards farmers. So that's why this uh, uh, it's so complex because now you're dealing with the refuse of war in yeah. agriculture. Interesting. So, yes. So what happens is now these corporations know they want to uh, they want to advocate for the use of agriculture that is hi highly dependent on chemicals, okay? Yeah. okay? Yeah. So that they can create a market for themselves, not because it's good for the environment or it's because for you. So here you have corporations that are looking to sell as much chemicals as they possibly can to increase their profits. So they ask the government to go and subsidize their farmer to buy those chemicals. So basically what is happening in the U.S. is the population themselves are subsidizing the profits of the corporations. Because whenever the government gives subsidies to these farmers and they are giving the subsidies to farmers so that they can be able to buy those chemicals, they are bolstering the profits or the business of the big corporations. Is that situation so, similar here in Kenya? From okay, your own I'm analysis. coming to Kenya. Uh -huh. So I'll, tell, I'll give you corn, for example. The corn in America, the way they subsidize corn is they say, hey, look, grow corn. It doesn't matter. You just grow corn. Okay, so you grow mm -hmm. corn. When they grow the corn, they tell the, the, the farmer to take the corn to the international market. Okay? Yeah. When they take the corn to the international market, because the agriculture in America is highly dependent on uh, machines, you know, and uh, really expensive machines, the production cost per bushel or per, per ton is quite high. 
So American corn cannot compete with other corn, for example, from Africa, where we are using our hands. You know, the labor cost is small. Cheap, yeah. Farm, uh, the, the workers are not getting uh, benefits, you mm -hmm. know, social security, you know, no benefits at all. So the, the production cost of corn in America, Kenya is very low. So when the American farmer takes their corn to the market, they cannot be able to find uh, any market because the cost is so high. So what the American government tells them, sell them, sell them lower than the person who is the lowest seller in the market. So maybe the lowest uh, person Kenya produces is the lowest, has the lowest cost of production for the corn. And it produces a 50 shillings, per, for example. So they tell them, no, sell it at 45. But their production cost might be 90. So mm -hmm. the government will cover the, the difference and give them a profit. For my interest. So therefore, they are disadvantaging the, the market. So there's no yeah. such a thing as a free market. So what happens is that now the farmer in Kenya will eventually have to be driven out of the market and we have to buy American corn because their it's corn cheaper. is so cheap, yeah. right? It's cheaper. So back to the qu uh, original question about sustain. Is it not even uh, sustainable? Yeah. So because the, the government has been influenced by the large corporations to be biased towards the chemical uh, dependent agriculture, because now the corn becomes so cheap because it's subsidized by the government. So the farmers of animals like beef, chicken, they have pigs, they, they, they eat the cheapest feed source, source of feed for them is corn because corn and soybeans because they are being subsidized by the government. They are so cheap, you know, nobody can compete in that market, in the meat market, feeding their animals anything else other than corn and soybeans because they are so heavily uh, subsidized by the government. Most farmers know up enough about agriculture in Kenya mm -hmm. to know that you can't keep growing the same uh, product over and over and over again on the same piece of land. Yeah. So you have to rotate the, yeah. uh, the, the food, Crops. right? So yeah. In, yeah. So uh, by the way, remember, America grows enough corn to feed the whole world. The amount of corn that uh, about uh, But America I believe they feed grow. the corn to animals, to cows. To the animals. They, yeah. yeah to, they, they feed the animals. So that's one. So you there you have the corn. This, this is where the soil comes in. The crop that they use to rot it whenever they are not growing corn on, on most of that land is soybeans. So here you have you have an excess amount of uh, corn, you have an excess amount of soybean. And I don't know whether you've ever gone to anybody's house and they serve you soybean. They cook actual beans for you, right? So mm -hmm. here you have a lot of soy then the people don't know what to do with so they feed it to the animals. So ah. that's why. So if so if they are used, they are, oh yeah, they are high, and they even try to sell soy milk and to push it as so is a healthy option because it's not dairy. The reason for I actually why thought so. Primarily, I actually thought so. No, 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 it's not. It's not, man. That's a topic for another day. <laughs> so we can just say for, for this. The only reason why they are selling soy milk is they don't know what to do with to all do, these oh excess my beans. God. Right? So they sell you and they tell you, can, can you imagine how difficult you, you the go crazy things people do to make profit. Yeah, they talk about people making profits. It's bad. Right? Yeah. So back to your point about sustainability. So if they are using of all the plants you can grow, corn is the one that uses the most fertilizer. No other plant can consume and that we use as a grain can consume more fertilizer than corn. So we're using a lot of fertilizer to grow the corn. Then we grow soybean on the same soil and then we use Roundup on top of it, right? And we're using round, Roundup on that ground, you know, to kill the weeds, all that kind of stuff. There are other chemicals that I use like atrazine. We can talk about that for another day. But at least just to stay uh, on the track of sustainability is that now you have these Feed, uh, this uh, the feed of the animals of the chicken that we're using, yeah. having been fed with corn and soybean that was grown using what Roundup. Now yeah. Roundup, you know, that was sued, has been in court. There yeah, actually, saw that. that yeah. Yeah, 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 twenty five. There was twenty five thousand cases. Twenty five thousand cases. The last time I checked. You've talked a lot on uh, nothing is more political than food. And I believe it's yes. among one of your favorite lines. I actually even saw it on your website. Maybe you can explain yes. to us why you say that. And yes. also, you can also try to link it in a Kenyan perspective. I believe uh, for our listeners, I've already started by indicating how yeah. political food is. Yeah. By explaining how it's tied to our jobs, it's tied to our health. And uh, if you had a chance to look, look at mm -hmm. the, my website and you 
saw the illustration that was done by yeah. American Anthropological Association, you saw the analysis that I gave, which is based on my anthropological observation of mm-hmm. our society, is that most people were in make a, a good living if, if you have a middle income and you know you you retire, you send your kids to school, you retire, and then you have a plot somewhere or you have a land somewhere, and then you retire. And then you, by retiring, you figure, hey, man, I'm going to enjoy the sunset days, man. I'm going to have an easy time. I'm good. But the reality is that when most people retire, they get sick. When they get sick, they go to the hospital. When they go to the hospital, they realize that the medication and uh, medical care is so expensive, they can't yeah. afford it. So mm-hmm. one, they either try to dispose some of the assets they have, and even worse, they start asking their children to help them pay for their medical care. Essentially, what you people are doing, if you look at that process, is that we, uh, the person who is sick now, which is, uh, we're starting with the father, the father and the children and the grandchildren, right? If you look at it uh, just from that model, what the father is doing is they're actually cannibalizing the future of their grandchildren. Because now the money that the ch- their children are, are using to take care of their health care is the money that their children should be should have been using to take to create a better future for their for this for the father's gra- grandchildren. So you see, so in other words, we are becoming weaker over time. And food is deeply tied to some of our health issues. Our health issues, the, the largest cost uh, of our health uh, issues are not even now, infectious diseases. They are, they are what they are called non-communicable diseases like obesity, cancer. All those are things that are related to, to our diet. And, and even if we were to at least remove that, then I think Kenya would be so much better uh, in a, such a uh, so much better position to deal with the other issue. But now we have the infectious decision, uh, diseases, then we have the non-communicable diseases and, and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. But the one that we have the most control over is mm-hmm. our food. Chef Kaboy, you passionately speak about resistance, resistance to corporate control, control of seeds and input, Mm -hmm. and loss of food cultures as a result. Yes. Why do you think this is important, both in the U.S. and Kenyan context? Yes. Uh, Obviously, we spend a lot of our time trying to get food and sustenance. The one basic thing, the first basic need that we have is food. We can live under the bridge, you have to eat. Whatever, whatever you have to do, you have to eat. You know, so food is the first uh, basic uh, need. You know, yeah. uh, shelter mm-hmm. and clothing. Yes, right. If you can get that basic need in reasonable time, that will really affect your culture. If you have to walk twenty miles to get water, twenty miles to go and get food. If you have to work extra hard, if you have to use such a big part of your income to buy just to buy, buy food, seeds and all that kind of stuff, and also to buy seeds seeds, chemicals, and all that kind of stuff, that will definitely impact the kind of culture and lifestyle you live. So if somebody, as I said earlier, that somebody is, will want to continue the same oppressive tendencies mm-hmm. they have been contr- uh, 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 having over you, is one, to control the seed. If I have the seed, then I dictate the price of a seed because you don't have any other source of a seed. And th- that is actually where we, what genetically modified organism, that's the foundation of genetically modified organism is, is that somebody gets a patent, mm-hmm. so that's a seed becomes intellectual property for the very first time in our human existence. No other time has a seed been the intellectual property of anybody. Yeah, according to American law, it was illegal, or even international law, it was illegal to patent a living organism. I mean, how do you patent a cow? How can you patent a goat, for mm-hmm. example? That's something that's already existing. You patent something that's your intellectual property. So uh, one corporation had to come up with a very creative way of creating a bacteria. They created a bacteria and say, oh, this bacteria is new. We created it. By doing so, they changed the law. That allows them for them to go to the Supreme Court and get, win a case that say they are or legally have the legal foundation for creating for patenting organism. So they would change seeds and then those seeds would become the intellectual property of those corporations, meaning that nobody else can grow those seeds without their permission. Wow. That gives is the situation them a right similar to here in Kenya? A penny. It is there. It's gone. Yeah. If you got growing GMO food, that's what I'm explaining to you. Uh-huh. That those, those seeds that we grow in Kenya, if they are GMO, they are the intellectual property of those corporations. And those corporate, some of those seeds have what you call death gene in them. Once you grow them one time, you can't get you can't them again. You can't Wow, that means uh, during no, the planting you, you season, you have, have to them. buy again. Like, yeah, you go. That's so how you died, uh, you're tied to them. 
So you understand why I yeah. think I'm so passionate about it because I know somebody is setting us for for a trap. For example, you, you remember in Kenya mm-hmm. we had one it was a very big case uh, where a sitting president had had, had go to go had to go to the international criminal court, right? You yeah. Remember that? Yeah. So let's say Kenya said, "Oh, we don't want to comply with that. We don't want to send our president. Our president is not going to go." Mm-hmm. Okay, these big uh, countries could, for example, in the future, conceptually. So conceptually, I'm not saying they're, they're yeah. I'm saying yeah. they're, think about that. Uh-huh. They can say, "Look, we don't have to come and fight you with guns. We don't have to come and drop bombs on you. All we have to do is say we're not going to send the next uh, generation of seeds." We're not sending the next shipment of oh, seeds yeah, because yeah. you don't have any seeds. Yes. Come to think of it, yeah, okay. yeah. Yes. that yes. means. So oh you see God. how political it is. Yeah, yeah, very political. Yeah, so it is very political. Think about it, Felista. That uh, there's a book called The Art of War. According to The Art of War, uh-huh. the best war war is the one that you win without fighting, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the best political move is to to play a game on people where people are really oblivious to to the game that you're playing. You see? Yeah. So if people don't really think too much about food, that's a weapon. That's the most effective weapon for you to again use against the people. So if people are food illiterate, you can play games with them all day. You can tell them to put chemicals on there. They put the chemicals. You say, "Come and eat this. They come eat my chicken is the best. They come eat yours. They have they leave their chicken alone." I was dismayed like, beyond words when I saw the line that people were Kenyans were queuing to buy chicken from these foreign companies. What has struck you the most in your exploration of the intersection between food? You've actually talked so much about colonialism, sovereignty, and personal view. What has struck me the most is mm-hmm. that the solutions are very so easy. They are so easy, but yet they, they are so difficult. I'd rather be doing other things, right? I started doing what I'm doing because I could not believe that, right? That yeah. this thing can be so easy as let's grow our own food. Let's understand that the reason why we are getting sick. People are getting sick. But yet we are not doing it. Why? Because the people who benefit from it are so s- smart and they are so much ahead of the game that they've been able to create a system that almost below the with our radar. This whole system was created below our radar. We had seed companies, we had textile companies in a lot of African countries. Now a lot of those country, African countries don't have it. If you have uh, read a little bit about uh, Thomas Sankara, Thomas Sankara said, "Don't ask me where neocolonialism is. Is in the play." I almost fell. Yeah. I, I think that's the thing that struck me the most. They did a, a case study. And the case study shows that in Zambia, the government is pushing genetically modified seeds. Okay, mm-hmm. and the government is subsidizing those seeds because those seeds are so expensive. So, mm-hmm. but those seeds, especially corn, those corn seeds produce per acre about, uh, let's say, one ton, one ton mm-hmm. per acre. The same seeds in Iowa produce 16 tons. So we are using seeds but because expensive seeds but because we can't have all the implements all the chemicals that need to be used we are buying seeds that are not really boosting our our production by that much so how, how is that sensible and the government mm-hmm. is subsidizing those seeds so that's number one. number two, a lot of the loans that africans get african countries and other uh, by the way I, i i i'm not only mean african yeah. i'm using africa because we are in africa but it's not any different from other countries that are dominated so called developing countries they then whenever they get loans from the uh, the world bank mm-hmm. those loans cannot be used to subsidize farmers except when you think about when you look at with the fine print except when they are subsidizing the farmers to buy western implements mm-hmm. so they can be subsidized so the farmers in zambia can be subsidized by the government as long as they are buying gmo seeds from america corporation yeah as we went down chef kabui what trends and practices can we adapt individually and collectively as we begin to try and get back the freedoms that we had in our farming and food systems one but we have to think ourselves about, about uh, this topic and the way same way we think about war okay because it's, it's a struggle to liberate ourselves right so yeah. you want to use the war you want to start struggle that's fine i don't have a problem but when you you can't go to war without a strategy you can't engage in any struggle without a strategy yeah. even if it's a game you're it's odds you know you, so you always have to ask yourself first what's the terrain If you yeah. are soccer football team or you any team you have to say okay who are we playing or is God Mahia after against Mathare United or if it's God Mahia uh, versus uh, or AFC versus a much lesser uh, dom- uh, strong team then you know you you make your strategy uh, accordingly so we have to first understand the, the terrain that we are dealing with 
right? And that's what I think what you're doing, uh, Food Rob is doing such a great job trying to expose our listeners to the terrain. So first understand the terrain. When you understand the terrain, then mm-hmm. you come up with two strategies. What is the most effective way to deal with a problem that we have established first? One, as a country. Secondly, as a community or as a region. Thirdly, as an individual uh, on a personal level. All this has to be fed by one thing, which is what I want to finish with and which prior I could have also started with. We have to have a think tank mm-hmm. or a, a study or comprehensive study so that we comprehensively understand the issue of food literacy. You kept on mentioning food literacy. What What is food literacy? A food literacy is a concept, but by the way, I came I came up with that. I, I mentioned to you that uh, that uh, when I finished my master's, instead of going, going to do my traditional yeah. PhD, I did my own PhD, my own PhD study, you know, as a form of my PhD. So what, one of the things I came out of with was the idea of food literacy. That I realized, I started looking at food the same way I look at education, for example. If mm-hmm. you're illiterate, means you can read. Or you say, I'm illiterate, you can read, you can write. If you look at the way we interact with food now, we are illiterate about food. If you had food literacy, it will allow you to, to read. You say, okay, I'm going north, this say south. Okay, no, no, I don't need to go. Then you can decide based on solid information. If you're food illiterate, we just eat. We eat. And we disempower ourselves because we are illiterate about food. Uh, finally, this is a time where you share with us one of your favorite recipes so far. <laughs> <laughs> so since recipe, you're not going to give us food yeah yeah it's true uh number one i, I would uh maybe i can promise i don't know whether that will be a working view of a recipe i can say hey i promise that when i come to kenya we can we can organize a food event and people can come and actually taste food literacy for themselves free food <laughs> but, um, free food free food uh i don't know you tell me what, what do you think should we do, do free food or should we do a food, a fine dining? You tell me. Free food. <laughs> you see, free food. There's no free food, by uh-huh. the way. For me, I always won't like to pay for my food because when I pay, I can dictate what I'm getting. But if somebody just give me free food, <laughs> anyway, uh, let's uh, <laughs> uh, uh, go back to the point. Yeah. So how, how do you want me to give you a recipe? Do you want me to say, share the recipe with the guests? Uh, and uh, we can put it on our site somewhere or do you want me to tell you? Uh, I just want to make sure I'm answering your question. Just you tell me, to yeah, tell, tell me. Yeah, yeah. I can tell you, uh, I made the last recipe, my my favorite recipes are always the one that I, I'm about to make. You mm-hmm. know? Uh, and that's where I push myself. That's just philosophical way of looking at it. So I always challenge myself. And by the way, I have all my recipes are recipes that I create. I don't, use, I don't necessarily use other people's recipes, not that I have a problem with it, but my focus is to enhance African food, to elevate it to the next level. A friend of mine, or not somebody I presented at a conference with, did a study of all ethnic food, and they found the most expensive food in America is French food, then followed by a, uh, Japanese food and so on and so on. African food didn't even rank there. What? It didn't rank. It, all the ethnic food, it didn't rank. Our food is so cheap. So for me, I try to, to, to create really high elevated food, expensive food, you know. The last dinner yeah. I did in Kenya, it was for 9,000, uh, I think 9,800 uh, or 9,500 uh, for a dinner. Because food food can be something that you experience and can be high high level. Anyway, I'm saying that to say that uh, I'm always creating recipes. No, mm-hmm. I love other, I have other chefs I love, I enjoy their food, you know. But I'm saying I make mine. For me, I make the recipes I make my own recipes and I'm always ever creating recipes. So the last one I created was in, in our honor of my teacher. And I may name all my recipes, things that I've seen in the past, but names of my village, mm-hmm. people I've learned from, right? So the last recipe I made was called Gashie, Gashie Green Recipe from two of my f- favorite teachers. By the way, I didn't learn how to read until I was in the f- uh, fourth grade, so standard fourth. So uh, I almost really uh, dropped out of school. But the one teacher saved me by teaching me how to read. The first word I read was boy. And for that uh, teacher, unfortunately, just passed away before I, I made a dinner for, for her. I wanted to make an illustrious nine-course dinner for her. But anyway, so Gashia dinner was, uh, this is the recipe. Yeah? It was made out of uh, daikon radish, out of? Uh, watermelon radish, uh-huh. daikon radish, da- daikon radish, watermelon radish, avocado, tam- fresh tamarind, black pepper, uh, cloves, uh, cumin, salt, and uh, our traditional beans. Uh, I don't know what they call them. They call them jowo, jowo. You know, the traditional uh, Kenyan jowo? Or, no. Uh, 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 you know? 
no, uh, no. What, I don't know the, the English name yeah oh, the Kiswahili but, uh, they, name uh, Kiswahili name they are the Kikuyu Njugus I, uh, I have I've, oh Njugu the normal Njugu Njugu, njugu. Jogo yeah. They are, they are round. They are no 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 no. They, they are a type of bean, a round bean. Yeah, they are, they are kikuyu beans. The two kikuyu beans were one that's black has a, a, a like a white line. Jahe. Jahe, jahe, the jahes. Yes, the jahes. Ah. Yes, then I I I prepared the jahe. That's that was my last recipe. And then I served it with a um, sunflower uh sprout, sprouted sunflower. Oh, it's delicious and and uh, olive oil. Uh, to talk it was a salad it was even my children they loved it they ate all of it they all <laughs> I didn't even get enough but in anyway, that's my favorite <laughs> recipe so far you talk to me next week I have another <laughs> I'll definitely one. try but that yeah, one but, uh, but lastly if I can say this uh, I, I'll be remiss if I didn't say that because I add this in all my uh, talks that millet is the number one grain that I promote in the US some in fact some people call me the uh, millet ambassador because millet is one of the longest domesticated grains and is very very common in Africa and it is also very easy to make it's very sumptuous i make desserts with it i make it for breakfast i make it for uh, as a accompaniment for for uh, as a grain instead of rice like i said and it's very easy to grow and it's very very nutritious so millet is another favorite just one last question why did you decide to go the organic way in your work Number one, uh, you know, I care about myself. By the way, you know, alienation, the whole idea of alien uh, of oppression is to alienate. You know, we become alienated from our land, that's colonialism. We become alienated from our culture, colonialism. And we become alienated from our language, so alienation, alienation, alienation. So chemicals is another, uh, you, the use of chemicals is another way of alienating myself. Okay, because mm-hmm. I have to use money. I give other people money. Okay, I'm being alienated from my uh, from my, my resources because I'm giving money that I that, that doesn't really necessarily benefit me. So, is it going organic organic for me? It's healthier, you know. Uh, it's good for the environment. Uh, it's good for my community, uh, and it's good for my children because some of the chemicals we use uh, damage our genetics. So, you're not only damaging yourself, you're also damaging the children, your posterity. So you are suffering not because of your, what your mother ate but what your grandmother. How how weird, uh, how crazy man can that be? That you are paying for the sins of your grandmother. Thank you so much Chef Kabui for your insights. I've actually picked a lot from the conversation and thank you for sharing the recipe as well. For our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any questions, feel free to write to us on info@trutofood.org. See you again next week on Friday for more exciting conversations. Follow us on SoundCloud, Achakula Podcast, like, share and leave us a comment. You can also find us on Apple Podcast, Achakula Podcast. Subscribe, rate and review. Thank you.